In elementary school, we started learning numbers using a number line like this one. Starting from the number 1, you would count up until you ran out of breath. This set of numbers is known as the natural set of numbers. And at some point in elementary school, you would have learned that there's a value used to describe nothing, which is 0. This is the set of whole numbers. Fast forward to junior high, and we learned that this number line doesn't point in one direction. It points in the other direction as well. This is known as the set of integers. We also learned that you can have values that fall in between numbers, such as 3.5 or 2 thirds. These are known as rational numbers. In high school, we learned this new concept called the square root. For example, the square root of 81 is 9, and the square root of 9 is 3. But what if you tried to find the answer of a negative number? A calculator would give you an error. But you might have heard from someone that the square root of negative 1 is i. But where is i on this number line? Well, to answer that question, we can't treat the number line as one dimension anymore. We need to phase shift into the other dimension. The imaginary dimension. Dun, dun, dun. The type of numbers that were covered so far are known as real numbers. This includes natural numbers, whole numbers, integers, rational, and irrational numbers. This is just a one-dimensional number line. But it is possible to have numbers not lie on this number line. Just like how a piece of paper isn't one-dimensional, the number line isn't one-dimensional either. It is possible for numbers to float completely away from this real number line. This new orthogonal dimension is known as the imaginary number line. Please don't confuse the imaginary axis as the y-axis of a Cartesian plane, where in that realm, both the x and y axis are real. We're essentially talking about just the x axis by itself that can phase shift out of alignment with itself. Yeah, it's a really trippy concept. All right, back to the complex plane. So real numbers such as 3, 4, and negative 5 can be represented by placing them here on this horizontal line. And imaginary numbers such as i, 3i, and negative 2i are placed up and below here in this new vertical line. Now it is possible for numbers to be partially real and partially imaginary, like this one over here, or this one, or this one, or even this one. But we'll just stick to one example floating right over here. We see that this number is partially real and partially imaginary. If we count across, the real component is 4, and if we count upwards, the imaginary component is 3i. If we use a protractor, we see that this number is roughly 37 degrees out of alignment with the real axis. And if we use a ruler, we see that this number is 5 units away from 0. So the weird number floating here can be represented two different ways, either as a complex number of 4 plus 3i, or as a polar coordinate having a magnitude of 5 and a phase shift of 36.9 degrees. And yes, you can solve the second method using a modified version of the Pythagorean formula and knowing a little bit of trigonometry. Speaking of magnitude, the proper definition of magnitude is how far away a number is from zero. So seven is seven units away from zero. Negative five is five units away from zero. Three i is three units away from zero, and negative two i is two units away from zero. At the end of the day, a complex number is nothing more than just a value that has been phase shift out of alignment with the regular timeline as we know it. However, before we dive in too deep into the complex realm, let's review real numbers again. For example, if we try to do some basic math like 2 plus 3, we first start at 2 on the number line, jump 3 spaces to the right to add, and end up at 5. So 2 plus 3 is equal to 5. Or with another example, 7 subtract 3. We start at 7 on the number line, jump 3 spaces to the left to subtract, and end up at 4. Here's one more example, 4 subtract 7. We start at 4, jump 7 spaces to the left, and end up at negative 3. All these numbers work beautifully, as they're all real numbers. However, if you try to mix things up, like adding 5 with 3i, well, 5 lies right here, and adding 3i will shift us vertically out of alignment with the real number line. Since 5 and 3i are in different dimensions, we can't just add them together. So the final answer is just 5 plus 3i. Think about it this way. If you have two bunches of apples and you add them together, you can get a grand total of apples. 
But if you have a mixed bag of apples and potatoes, it is impossible to have a grand total of apples. You will have no choice but to separate them and count them out as individual sets. Multiplication, on the other hand, has its own set of rules. If we multiply 2 by 3, we are basically asking a person to start from 0, jump 2 spaces to the right, and repeat this process 3 times. So adding 2 3 times will work out to 6. That seems pretty straightforward. Here's another example. If we multiply negative 2 by 3, we're really just moving 2 spaces to the left, starting from 0, and repeating it 3 times. So negative 2 times 3 equals negative 6. So far, all of this makes sense. The strange part is asking someone to multiply 2 by negative 3. How can we repeat a process negative 3 times? That doesn't make any sense at all. But luckily, multiplication is commutative, meaning that you can flip the positions of the numbers around and it'll still work out. After all, 2 times 3 is 6, and 3 times 2 is still 6. So 2 times negative 3 has the same meaning as negative 3 times 2. So shifting 3 spaces to the left 2 times ends up with an answer of negative 6. Of course, the strangest part is multiplying negative 2 by negative 3. How in the world does multiplying two negative numbers somehow become positive? The reality is that all of our calculations since grade 3 have been missing out on a crucial step. In all these years of learning math, your teachers have kept math simple by not telling you this additional secret. There's an angle associated with every number. This angle represents how much out of alignment a number is from the real dimension. Luckily, this missing step hasn't been a big deal at all, since all positive numbers lie right on the real number line. Yes, pun was intended. For example, the numbers 2 and 3 are in alignment with the positive number line and can be represented by 2 with an angle of 0 degrees and 3 with an angle of 0 degrees. Meanwhile, the numbers negative 2 and negative 3 point in the opposite direction of 0. If we pull out a protractor, we see that they are facing 180 degrees out of alignment with the positive number line. So those two can be represented as 2 with a phase shift of 180 degrees and 3 with a phase shift of 180 degrees. So here's the proper rule for multiplying. Step 1. Multiply the magnitude of the numbers. Step 2. Add the angles of the numbers together. And step 3. Show your final answer in a clean and organized manner. Let's revisit 2 times 3. First thing you do is multiply the magnitude of the numbers. In other words, the number without the angle. So 2 times 3 equals 6. Next, you add the angles. Since both 2 and 3 are positive, they both face right on the number line, making an angle of 0 degrees with the real axis. 0 degrees plus 0 degrees is equal to 0 degrees. So the final answer is 6 with a phase shift of 0 degrees, or just simply 6. Some viewers might notice that if you go full circle, you will still end up pointing in the positive direction. This is true. Zero degrees can be represented by 360 degrees or even 720 degrees. So even if you solve the problem like this, 2 with a phase shift of 360 degrees times 3 with a phase shift of 720 degrees, well, 2 times 3 still gives you 6, and 360 plus 720 equals 1080 degrees or three full rotations, which, guess what, brings you back to zero again, so you still get the same answer of six with a phase shift of zero at the end. Now let's revisit junior high math again, but this time with negative integers. What if we multiply negative two by three? Well, this can be expressed by two with a phase shift of 180 times three with a phase shift of zero. We continue with multiplying the magnitudes of two and three, which gives us six, and when we add the polar angles of 180 degrees plus 0 degrees, that gives us a grand total of 180 degrees. So our final answer is 6 with a phase shift of 180 degrees. In other words, negative 6. Make sense so far? So if we do the other weird example of 2 times negative 3, it can be represented by this expression. 2 with a phase shift of 0 times 3 with a phase shift of 180 degrees. Again, 2 times 3 is 6 and 0 plus 180 is equal to 180 degrees. So our final answer is still 6 with a phase shift of 180 degrees, or simply put, negative 6. And now for the crazy example. What if we multiply negative 2 by negative 3? 
Again, this can be represented by this expression. 2 with a phase shift of 180 degrees times 3 with a phase shift of 180 degrees. 2 times 3 is still 6, and 180 plus 180 equals 360 degrees. Remember that 360 degrees is a full rotation, which brings us back to 0 degrees again. So this is the actual reason why negative 2 times negative 3 equals positive 6. Mind blown number 1. By the way, if you add the polar angles together when multiplying, then you would subtract the polar angles when dividing. I hope that you'll try out this example on your own to prove why a positive number divided by a negative number equals a negative number, and why a negative number divided by a negative number equals a positive number. You can hit the spacebar right now or tap your screen to pause the video and try this out on your own. All right, now onto the big question. Why is the square root of negative 1 equal to i? First, let's recall the definition of a square root, which is finding out what number multiplied by itself will give you the initial value. As you need to multiply the same exact number by itself again to get to the original question, those two numbers must share the same angle. So what you're really doing is that you're doubling the angle when you're squaring a number. And when you square root, you'll have to do the opposite of doubling, which is dividing by 2. And yes, it's true. If you do a cubic root, you will have to divide the total angle by 3. For example, the square root of positive 9 is the same as the square root of 9 with a phase shift of 0 degrees. Now the square root of 9 by itself is 3, and half of 0 is still 0. So the square root of 9 is 3. But wait, there's a second possible answer. What if you defined 9 as 9 with a phase shift of 360 degrees? Well, the square root of 9 is still 3, but this time around, half of 360 degrees is 180. So the square root of positive 9 can also be written as 3 with a phase shift of 180 degrees, or negative 3. Remember, 3 times 3 is 9, and negative 3 times negative 3 is also 9. So there are two correct answers to the square root of 9. Okay, back on topic. So what is the square root of negative 1? Well, let's first represent negative 1 in its polar form. Since negative 1 is 180 degrees away from the positive side, we can represent it as 1 with a phase shift of 180 degrees. So the square root of 1 is still 1, and half of 180 degrees is 90 degrees. And if you take a look on the graph, the midway angle between the negative number line and the positive number line is pointing straight up, right into the imaginary dimension. That's the reason why the square root of negative 1 is equal to i. Mind blown explosion number 2. But wait again, we're not even done with the fun yet. Remember that 180 degrees can be achieved by rotating yet another 360 degrees around, giving a grand total of 540 degrees. The square root of 1 is still 1, but half of 540 degrees is 270 degrees. Rotating 270 degrees around counterclockwise points us into the negative imaginary dimension. So that's why the square root of negative 1 is equal to i, or negative i. Double mind explosion. All right, all right, one more crazy thing to think about. Why is i squared equal to negative 1? We know that i is equal to 1 with a phase shift of 90 degrees, so i squared is equal to 1 with a phase shift of 90 degrees times 1 with a phase shift of 90 degrees. As we know, 1 times 1 is still 1, and 90 degrees plus 90 degrees is equal to 180 degrees. So i squared is equal to 1 with a phase shift of 180 degrees, or out of pure simplicity, negative 1. I hope that you now have the real understanding of why i squared is equal to negative 1. Before we finish off, how about I share with you this classic Chinese story. There once was a little boy who wanted to learn how to write, so his dad hired him a tutor to teach him basic Chinese. The tutor starts off with counting. This is how you write the number 1, and wrote it down. The boy jumped with joy and said, Teach me more! Okay, replied the tutor, and said, This is how you write down the number 2, and wrote it down. The boy was delighted and said, Teach me some more! The tutor continues with showing the boy how to write the number 3. The boy thanked the tutor and said that he was done learning for the day. When his dad comes by later on to ask how he's progressing, he tells his dad, Hey Pops, I don't need the tutor anymore. I know how to write Chinese. Of course, dad was happy as he didn't have to pay the tutor anymore. A few weeks go by and his parents want to invite Uncle Juan over for dinner the following week. Of course, back then before smartphones, you would write letters to others. Since dad knew that his son could write, he asked his son, 
Hey, son, can you write a letter to Uncle Wan, inviting him over for dinner? The son said, yeah, no problem, and went right to his bedroom to compose a letter. Now, Wan in Chinese means 10,000, so his son begins to progress with strokes one after another after another. Three hours later, his dad comes by and is wondering why his son hasn't finished writing the letter yet. Of course, what he saw was something like this. If you know a bit of Chinese, you would know the proper way of writing down one is like this. The purpose of this story is to remind us that it's a big world out there, and there's a lot more to learn than just one, two, and three. So if you've stuck around this far in the video, I hope that you've gained a better appreciation of the crazy world of mathematics. And I've also gained the desire to learn new things that aren't necessarily taught in the classroom. And if there's enough demand for these type of nerdy videos, like a thousand views or so, I'll be sure to make a part two of this video where I'll show you a real life application of complex numbers. Until our next adventure together.